an integral part of the Cork International Poetry Festival is the Cork aspect of it. And this past year has there's been an amazing crop of new collections from poets living in Cork. So we like to count Cork poets as poets who were born here and poets who live here. Um, Paul Casey is somebody who was born here but spent his formative poetry years in South Africa. And Dernie Griffith has come to us from County Clare. But they're both so brilliant we, we, we call them uncategorically our own, <laughs> our own Cork poets. Uh, Paul, today, tonight is the occasion of uh, the publication of Paul's second collection. Dyrin has published two collections in the Irish language and the past year has published her first collection in English. Um, Paul's new collection is called Virtual Tides. Paul and Mian has written about it. This is a welcome new collection from a poet who has been an exemplary nurturer of other poets through Ovale, his renowned Cork-based reading series. These vivid and powerful poems are searing indictments of mealy-mouthed hypocrites. They hex anyone who stands in the path of goodness and light, and they ritualize expressions of compassion and love into powerful medicine for the head. Sophisticated and complex, they yet man manage to be generous and open-hearted, much like Paul Casey himself. Uh, Dernley Griffa had a, poem, had a poetry collection uh, reviewed in Poetry, the leading American uh, poetry journal, uh, by Maya Catherine Popper, who is a former winner of the O'Donoghue Prize. And she wrote, in Negriffa's English debut, what seem to be long considered obsessions are explored with tenderness and unflinching curiosity. The collection's section titles clasp, cleave, clench, suggest the muscularity of attachment to the past place and the body that drives the poetic impulse. Duren's collection Clasp uh, has been shortlisted for the Irish Times uh, Poetry Book Award. Uh, it's the closest we have to a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize or an Elliot Prize for, for a poetry collection in this country. Uh, because Paul is just out. He hadn't had a chance to be shortest on this occasion, we welcome it. We, we welcome the book and we wish it all the best of luck for next year. The two poets are going to read in alphabetical order. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. As ever. I suppose I should just say a few words of um, thanks before I get into this uh, new book. Um, to Salmon Poetry, who are uh, fantastic to work with as a publisher. Not only are they great, they have great design, you know, but uh, they, they're very far-reaching uh, uh, press. Um, I'll be launching it in Los Angeles at the end of March, which is fantastic, plus a string of readings around California, uh, and that's mainly uh, due to uh, Salmon, so I have to thank them. And uh, I have to thank... Rosie O'Regan for creating this absolutely beautiful cover. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah. Technology work. I can't see anyone, so I probably don't need don't need my glasses. <laughs> You're gonna read about fifteen poems to you at one time of various length. It's a fairly eclectic um, body of work, uh, both in form and subject matter. But uh, I originally got a, a bursary from the City Council in 2013, uh, having told them I wanted to go chase stone circles around West County Cork and Kerry. So that's how it began. But only a few stone circle poems actually ended up in the, uh, in the book. So I should really say thank you to Cork City Council Arts Office as well. Paper Stone Circles. Stone turns to paper in her eye as she filters cycles of light into circles of paper stones. Her eye is a stone circle 
a near infinity of light that sees the circle as finite, the near permanence of stone, the almost endless circle is light, impermanent as paper. Stone and white butterflies circle and circle her. She questions their sentience. Stone ancestors, paper-like circles, she sees them say, she hears their paper voices say, know your own time, be light, circle, stone. And another stone circle poem here, which is called Stone Circle Circle, <laughs> because it's partly concrete. It looks like that. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. so I need a, a sip of uh, Guinness to do this one. <clears throat> stone Circle Circle. Souls on fire spring from stone tip to stone age, stone tip <clears throat> around the circles of characters distinct as tribes, some tall, split thin as a crisp, or squat, the very shape of they who lugged and shoved. Nokakilla, Karaganimi, Karagakala, Nokrahim, Ranari, Gorpanimal, Karagafu, Karasna, Kalp, Tirgay, Kudaklavan, Karabeha, Nokanirk, Drumbeg, Rina Screen, Amaratan Valley, Karabrahan, Bahona, Letter Gorman, Nox, Kalana, Bargorum, Dumbeacon, Kelkil, Kalaman, Kabnabul, Mona Clay, Darren Affinchon, Darren Taggart, Ardgrim, Kashul Kilti, Shron Baran, Dramahili, Ura, Drumro, Gertine, Kenmer, Lissy Begin, Grange, Isnaka Gilarisht. And strewn stones, remnants of spells to expel spirits of mischievy. Magpies, pop, periphery, no matter what shiny offering. international citizen. The eyes are passports, as the eyes of wildcats bright beneath the moon that say, we are from here, as oxygen, water, sun are, arctic tern, shearwater, sandpiper, godwit, wheat ear, as monarch, the humpback are, the probing nostrils of newly acquainted rhino, Hundreds in the pitch black at Lake Rendezvous, from miles every which way, dawn leaves only footprints. Ghosts in New York, Seoul, Damascus, have mouths that sound as birds or goats sound. Who drew these lines between us? In the daylight, their busy day, busy heads control remote bodies, passport gazes set straight ahead. quite auspicious that I received this book on Monday, the first day of the Chinese year, the year of the monkey, and being a proud monkey myself, um, was uh, delighted to, to realize that I actually had three poems in here with monkeys in them. <laughs> so I'm going to read those for you now. Um, in Zululand, there's a, an expression called Mshadu was in Kao, which means um, the wedding of monkeys. Um, and it describes a sun, uh, a sun shower. Monkey's wedding. Hungry, we spied them in the trees before they fell upon us. Their tonguey claddings drunk on opposites. Her strewn trousseau of cloud, the net that drew us up from the muggy earth's hold, as the king's minky wings sang hot and low to the dangling jewels, tingle jangling from her tresses, dazzling each token witness with no duress but pure eye bliss, then welcomed us to feast, to ply us all with wonky monkey wedding wine, rain and sunshine at the same time, were winged into middling monks for a while, a minute, we winked and drank and smoked from the old yoke of jungle, dreading mind signs, made merry reason sound dangerous, and Pinky swore not to tell what we saw, still shocked as tourists in skis, woken midsummer without the snow, were told to go. It's such a brief moment when it's raining and the sun is shining on you at the same time. 
itch. Do you too stretch out an itch you cannot scratch? As chimps flout our kitsch conventions, quench, quash their flinching patches of ticks, lice, the tickle waits for no chimp. No, there is no unreachable itch, no cherry-picking moments when no one's watching to line stitches under fingernails for extra friction, or the untimely irritation in the shoe, or those no-go zone concentration killer clarity hijackers. A female crouches in mosquito-ridden water reed, watches humans hitch her sister to a thin wire, reaches for a scream she cannot pitch as we void the itch of time, scrape proof from view till all its vetch, snatched up, leaves but, rather, but a wretch of moments left to catch, to fetch our Chinese signs with cheers and cheery syllables. We want to chill, fetch up the char-grilled choices, try sauerkraut and stout for breakfast, perhaps forget the itch. Since school days, whence mitchers and snitchers first sprang, sprouted, we pout from our comforts, hatch batches of soon-to-be-scrapped plans, chink glasses, stretch out the fictions we cannot scratch. This next one, which has a couple of monkeys in it, um, began as an experiment um, and is essentially bringing together of abandoned lines. I originally had about a hundred abandoned lines and eventually managed to weave them into, um, into five sonic length uh, verses. On second thoughts. It's time for that coffee and packing up of principles and off to the imagined life, the lock of that stolen key. Could it be this torrent of barbarity we hear and see keeps us in constant mistrust of our own humanity? Being spoilt isn't just an expression, is it now? We can only do a lot with a little for so long, and traffic is all about flow and avoiding pretzels. Nasturtiums in our mouths are worth gardens, for deserted nets won't capture lines, lives, nor will reciting Pi to a thousand places, while high as fifth century stylites, our monkey brothers close at hand, Sun Mo Kong and Hanuman, finding Jupiter in the frosted pavements of the cities. There's so much more to what we've done than luck. Life won't run away at 24 frames per second in its timeline of deadlines laid pipe-like in the depths of an age when winters, late winters meant hot summers could zoo colonizing at a foot per day. So let's lay a full keel, flee livid with illusions of progress, the sky split by each in turn, for once shy and forever bitten, we wear all of our layers. We seek the unfound bodies that lie beneath the rain, shallow as a field of GM spuds in County Wicklow, and teach our phones to speak Irish so as to consider the price of being 100% Irish legal the full cost analysis. With the sacred now virtual, we're walking the world home as we protest through spending saved and unsaved time. <clears throat> Why count the days in pairs of socks or human chains and keys of corporate law and vagabondery? A thousand years ago, they'd all be dead men. What fools take on the trays of film characters, splice fantasy to their instinct, you see beauty as a jungle of endless species, a menu unmeant to be written or told, loss as an artist's heart, a black goat, the angel's share calling the shots, and that's the kettle calling the hog more efficient for you. Though it may well be a case of mistaken identity crisis, we have nothing left to give but the desire to give. Let's take our souls down to the dry cleaners for a spin. We've been stuffing the French press with ground-down words, doomsday scenarios, temporary considerations. If you discriminate among colorists, you're a colorist. And those 64 twits who make the world go round, <clears throat> indulging in the odd few delusions of grandeur, singing war as the appropriate response, and then of its nature. While others find teaspoons more lethal than knives, the lives of rolling stones won't end in their settling. 
what we imagine in dread can be actualized by all the wrong people, for we've imagined it unrealized. Dark cumulus speeds along the edge of your iris, and in each a flash, yes, you too harbor lightning. We talk of the dreaded ends of those we love, wish upon them more music, more life, while we share this one, dreaming in one tense, living the other, hoping beyond hope, the inevitable turns evitable. Too much, too soon, too little, too late, too cliched, too unique, there is no true synonym for synonym. Now we're specializing in generalizing, in a time loop of jumping through hoops. Can't change how we feel till we feel what we feel. And the thing about avocados is that downloading is our new favorite form of exercise. And how long is a moment? Excuse me a moment. I know it's not time yet. Has your imagination, too, been faithful? A too cool fool, you say? Perhaps a too cool fool. But happily too cool fool in search of that silent L in words where the phone won't play dead for long where the dead have been calling all day long, where summer thermals make earth clouds of the trees, or white-winged raindrops rise in pairs to the sky, only to fall as caustic grains of sapphire sand. Forget the house in the hills. We should stay right here, clarity being such a hard-won magnificence, and we so quick to cloud it. <coughs> Android I married, this heart that is not a phone, this answer any question in the world machine, unquestioning, backup brain, ever ready scrabble companion, sci-fi fantasy come true, and namer of stars, you're a legless personal typist in longhand, media mogul, radio, mp3 player, home theater, bank teller, and one-stop shop. Instant news, weather vane, compass rose, master slave, umbrella for cyber rain, pocket PC, instant handicap, voice to text poet pad, and digital grave. You morph to a mirror in a click. Some backgammon with that coffee love, a torch of blackest night, a map master, global positioning amigo, precision time machine, trusty teleporter. Dearest life remote control, take me now. <laughs> Dandelion. A hundred florets and seeds. Bitter cream of dandelion soup. Dante Leon salad saute. Tooth of lion wine. Few know. There's a good half calorie in the small flame, and twice the chance for dissociative identity disorder to arise in the Irish daisy root. For milk witch tears in the coffee, pier bed, wetter bed, dog piss in the pavement cracks, the mountain paths. Swine snout ruffles appetite, settles gut of truffle hog, heals injured human skin, inflammation, Relentless weeds of viral antibiotica, so-called sore-toothed, gangly-stalked puffballs just bursting with vitalities in refrains of A and C. With these face clock encroachments, antioxidants ticking out the right pulses for tonics and bloods, infections, the wildest of afflictions, they neutralize the pesticides we kill them with. General Lion Tooth's root extract is firing up the front lines of World War C, selectively targeting and reminding cells to commit suicide. Worm rose, butterflower, terapsicum, a hundred florets, a hundred seeds and their feathery parachutes just oozing with rubber grade latex laughter. <coughs> Going too quickly. Oh. Tell me to slow down if I am. This one's really a lament. Um, 
for a childhood not spent playing hurling. Uh, my Uncle Paddy made my first hurley for me when I was about seven or eight. Um, and I watched my dad play, and uh, it's a, come from a very big hurling family, really. Um, and it's something that I always wanted to do, and just couldn't. I was split the wrong schools, unfortunately. It's a little piece, it's called Question of Memory. When we won the five in a row, I played in goal just like my father and grandfather before me, and in five years, no slitter passed me by. They made me goalie of the century. I had women coming out my ears, and houses bought, and free pints for life, and the statue was a mighty touch. I'm still my favorite audience. The more I remember, the more I start swelling with pride with all those great things I wish I'd done. <laughs> Defence forces seek artists. Top officials are refusing to comment on speculation that modern military training techniques and codes of engagement are undergoing a revolutionary shift towards anti-war activity. One example rumoured to be a highly innovative diffusion gesture aimed to disarm aggression through immediate exposure to spontaneous music, practical jokes, rap, and dance. The trend may well be spreading, as reports continue of platoons trading hardware for guitars, microphones, portable amps, and venue space to hold non-stop concerts without borders, as major <coughs> arms manufacturers wield placards alongside scrap metal merchants from the anti-art movements. Meanwhile, Queen Surikit still manufactures new reefs, dumping tanks, armored cars into the sea. Fish numbers have swelled significantly, diverse now beyond expectation, despite draconian defamation laws. Her generals, newly formed a cappella barbershop quartets and popular YouTube channels, allegedly feature her royal knights <coughs> throwing in the crown jewels, having borrowed the Irish Defence Forces strategy to melt down all lethal metal objects to form symbols, xylophones, drums and instrument strings, plans to adopt the ever more popular slogan, sort it out with art, poets with relevant translation skills urgently required within. <laughs> Stars are born, people die. More stars than people by far reborn as stars. And more stars than grains of sand. The number of grains of sand, 7.5 times 10 to the 18 grains of sand. Seven quintillion, 500 quadrillion grains, we believe, give or take a few grains of sand. The number of stars, 70,000 million, million, million stars, the same number as molecules and 10 drops of water. So there are more worlds in 11 of your teardrops than stars or grains of sand. <laughs> Laughing Lama. This one comes with an epigraph. Um, difficulty comes with the third mosquito said the Dalai Lama. How shall we lift the blindness, he asks, between fits of laughter, that hides the imperceptible joy source of their joy, when we could all be laughing, throughout the day, through loss, death. Just imagine the world so, once stoic briefcase emissaries, now laughing, chuckling bus drivers, Beggars in stitches, prisoners in spasms, celebratory dustbin men, judges, Guinness Book records for the longest, loudest howl, shriek, and scream of laughter, most aesthetically pleasing giggle, most people laughing at once, deepest and highest pitches of hysterics, signs in operating theaters, no laughing during surgery, please. 
competitions for the sweetest, most experimental, immediate, quickest, off-the-mark bursts of laughter, most infectious, trios and quartets of laughers, national orchestras of merrymaking, and international public laughing holidays, a ministry of mirth. It's so simple, he sees, takes a breath, and bursts into laughter. <laughs> Almost done, just two short rounds left for you. Alfalfa and cursive. So that the nib stays on the page in continuous curlicue from the ear of the first A to the last A's tail, in one fluid motion, symbol of never ending conjoined curves, I say, I write, alfalfa. And so that I may jib and tack through the gusting of language without pause, muscles of the hand flowing in obeisance to the electric infinity of sound shapes, I say and write, alfalfa, 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 alfalfa. It's my favorite word. And lastly, kudzu, which I should thank Pat for for putting into the Irish examiner from your last year. Thanks, Pat. Kudzu. And thank you all for listening. It's been a pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to reading with Diren. Delighted to read with Diren. So, thank you, Diren. Kudzu. Barely perceptible, it began at the window frames, padding its broad leaves like moss across the non-stop motion bonsai forest floor, light greening to peripheral mist, Eyes consumed by PC screen, oblivious. Weeks streak by as the low susurrus virus rustle covers radio, bookshelves, printer and bonsai, a gradual stranglehold on the whole supply. As it reaches the lip of the cold coffee cup, it takes a while to find I cannot pry myself from the desk. I watch as the forest of undergrowth constricts like rhododendron, my calves, binds all below waist to the floor. I'm stranded, android just out of reach, not upgraded to the robotic, limbed version in time. Voice activation windows have all passed by. Roots have plunged into every digital and organic crevice. This is my final squeeze of art. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely reading. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to reading the book very much. Um, I remember when my last book, this book class, was coming out, the lovely poet Tom Carthy said to me, I hope it will be lucky for you. There's some books are lucky, and I hope this will be a lucky one for you, and I hope that will be a lucky one for you. <laughs> I do want to start this reading without saying something really important. Um, we're a room full here of, of eager readers and writers, and it's always lovely to be among your own tribe that way. But none of us would be here now if it wasn't for Pat Cotter and Jane Matthews and the Monster Literature Centre. And they do this city and this country proud with all their hard work, and Paul Casey as well with his work at Ovade. I dread to think how impoverished Cork City would be without those three people. And I think <laughs> I think it's really fucking important to say thank you and thank you for required, so thank you Pat and Ben and Paul. Um, so I'm going to start with two Cork poems. The first one is from class. I moved to Cork City when I was 17. And I fell in love with it, like so many people do. And I'm 34 now, so it's half my lifetime. It's been in and around Cork. And um, 
I married a Cork man and we're raising four Cork children together. <laughs> and there's no way they're ever going to be clear children, so I just have to accept that. And for years we lived in a very small, in one of the two up, two down houses just up on the hill there. So I'd like to read um, a poem based there. From Richmond Hill. Home from hospital, you doze in my arm, milk drunk, all eyelashes, cheeks and raw umbilical, swaddled in the heavy black smells of the brewery. Your great-grandfathers worked all their lives in that factory. Every day they were there, breathing the same air, hoisting barrels, sweating over vats where black bubbles rose like fat. At dusk they poured into pubs and ordered porter, neat black pints lidded with white silk, thick as cream from frothing milk, and their replies were always the same, the gasp, the nod. Down gullets and guts went the porter, went the pay, went the nights and days, every day the same, coins slapped on the counter, no change. In my arms you stir, a thousand street lamps flicker to light in the dusk. As I watch your eyes open, the reek of roasting hops knits a blanket of scent around us. Next, I'm going to do one more hot one. While bleeding. In a vintage boutique on Sullivan's Quay, I lift a winter coat with narrow bodice, neat lapels, a fallen hem. It's far too expensive for me, but the handwritten label, 1915, brings it to my chest in armfuls of red. In that year, someone drew a blade through a bolt of fabric and stitched this coat into being. I carry it to the dressing room, slip my arms in, silk lining spills against my skin. I clasp the belt and draw a slow breath as a cramp curls again, where blood stirs and melts. In glass, I am wrapped in the weight of old red. Red, pinched into girl cheeks and smeared from torn knees, lip lipstick blotted on tissue, bitten lips, a rough kiss. All the red bled into pads and rags, the weight of red, the weight for red that we share. In the mirror, the old coat blushes. This pocket may once have sheltered something precious, a necklace, a love letter, or a fresh egg, feather warm, its shell brittle around a hidden inner glow, held loosely so it couldn't crack, couldn't leak through seams, so it couldn't stain the dress within. Um, I'd like to give you kind of a flavour of my new work now. Um, I gave birth a few months ago to a, a tiny girl and um, I always have this strange experience when I'm pregnant as a writer. Um, and there's this Alice Munro quote that really resonates with my own experience of that, where she says, I was writing desperately all the time I was pregnant because I thought I would never be able to write afterwards. <laughs> Each pregnancy spurred me to get something big done before the baby was born. And I've really shared that sense of urgency, this kind of weird creative electricity, and it's carried me through each one of my pregnancies and birth and over to the other side, and you think I'd learn that, you know, it's okay, you know, it's going to keep going, but I always think this is it, I'm done, I'm done for um, some kind of strange combination of hormones and sleep deprivation and stuff. And it sounds good that that happens, but it's hard to be normal when you're kind of half daydreaming and having to deal with, like, milk and natties and everything at the same time. It's strange. Um, I'm a strange mother to have. So <laughs> I've chosen one birth poem and then I won't inflict any more birth or baby writing on you. And I'm going to do one of my new language poems, two <coughs> bilingual poems, and I'll finish with one poem from CLASP. So five poems total. Um, so the birth of my daughter was 
very joyful but very frightening again. She was born early and um, she was very close to being stillborn and I was in danger as well, although I tend not to kind of think about that much at all. This poem was written while I was on spiny morphine, so it's really strange. <laughs> um, when I kind of came to after weeks of, of um, being by her bedside, by the incubator, um, I was like, there's something in that, but it's very strange, so I'm going to, you're going to be my guinea pigs now for the next few poems. Um, I expect feedback from everyone afterwards. <laughs> so this is called Lines Written on Spinal Morphine. Call it a hospital, and it is, but call it a hive and it splits into divisions where we become bees hovering, nectar flecked, through a multi-storied maze where we flit and fizz. Plump honeybees we flicker through dawn dark corridors to the distant rooms of neonatal ICU. We limp, all bristling stitches, morphine drips, engorgements, shuffling to incubators clotted with knots of new. There, our breath is gas on glass, where small hands grasp at air. We wince when we sit by our infants, grimace over our bruised inner throbs, our queried clots, our weeping insides, our leaking gasps. At night, the hive pulses with the buzz of breast bumps, dull, dull drone of rush and suck and rush and suck, and we stumble glide through corridors on bruised wings, gripping fields of yellow nectar. Below, in soft, brood chambers, our young wait for us. We are a swarm of bees, of which I am only one, and you are another, my final child, girl of honey spun tall. I fill your ears with new words, let my voice become the first to touch your spiralled cochlea. I say froth and cusp. I say rushed and blood. I tremble and say cloud and dandelion and plum. All night I goo and gaw in your sleeping ear, clumps of words spilling from me, a mess of morphine jumbled syllables. <coughs> and oh, my love, Imagine all the floors above us that brim and buzz. Can you hear the chorus we have become? So. Um, I've been writing a lot of poems around language rupture. Like I, I work in both languages and um, I love Irish. I get a lot of people approaching me with their own personal issues about Irish. And, um, <laughs> like, you know, I, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. And um, I've no answers. But I'm very interested in that ambivalence that so many of us have around Irish. And, like, even though I'm a fluent Irish speaker, I have issues around it as well. You know, like, I have a fluency in the language. And then simultaneously, I'm not fluent enough. If you know what I mean, like I'm not, I'm not quite like, I'm not fluent enough. I'm not, I'm not really there. So I can share a lot of that ambivalence, um, but I love it as well. So I've been thinking a lot around that with these new poems, and this is one of them. I'm really interested in human anatomy as well. There's one Irish phrase in it that you might not know, which is curry gale. It means like um, hypocrisy or a bluff, um, like. Curry Gale goes space at the road and it's like, you know, you're pretending that you're interested or that you're into something. Um, this is called a jaw ajar. Suppose you hold a jawbone so old that the chin has split. A professor passes samples of bone around, explains remains, derelict workhouse, family era, a mass grave. He rattles a transparent plastic bag. Inside, a clatter of speechless teeth, a broken grin. He says, a generous selection of fragments, says, incremental dentine collagen analysis, says, please pinpoint when starvation set in. <laughs> Suppose you hold the empty jawbone still, two neat halves, one in each hand, the pale bone cool in your palms, 
three teeth still tucked into their sockets, snug as heifers working cud in some distant meadow. Suppose you hold these jawbones together and see it not as a broken, inanimate object, but full skinned, a stubbled chin, a cheek that lived, that was patted, kissed, hit, and between those bones, a mouth that only ever knew the spit and speech of one warm, wet tongue. Suppose you hold this split jawbone to your ear and imagine that you hear all he ever spoke, every sound from his throat. This jawbone dates a time and reason where on, or time and region where only Irish were spoken. Holding it, you want to return to it some of the words that once resonated through its hollows, but your voice catches in your throat, as though something inside you is broken. <clears throat> Suppose the professor approaches, smiling as always, and says, This is demandable, what would you call that in Gaelic? You stare at him, bones in hand, your jaw ajar. Suppose you stutter, your mouth fails. You try to say Curran Gale, but the only sound from your mouth is Curry Gale. Um, I'm going to read two new Irish poems. Um, and they're still kind of in progress there, a bit rough around the edges and places, so be patient with me, please. Um, and I've translated them to English especially for you tonight. Um, the first one's called Tuhil. And it's about bleeding a heater, kind of. <laughs> they're all kind of based in houses and housey stuff. Um, Tuhil. Kram ucker i bowl and tehora, agus kasim an chofle er Tuhil, sheer. Sheer, Gudiga Glusham Shilla, and Tishke, a glugger Nahasi, Mrainta, Chuva, and Tear of Vishrinta, Squealta, Rish, the click of his trick a trick, Filin Quishla, and Fipa, a tarrant chas, a rash, three horse, so he'll hunt tea, three echa of his artery, full of we crack in the bally, Run Divrach, Donin, a fector, a vogan, fui drumkla, owl, ibru click. Smuini and Sheer on Glog Klinga, a Jach Machiana Water, August and Schiel, a Dinner She Golney, Fui Law Sowery, August Ian a Van Og Nua Fosta, Falka in a Ainer Han and Dinera Rachach, Tablo, and Bela Rig, Bord Laka, and Orlar Scoopa, Shat Yashi, a Fanachterhu, a Law of Trum Gan Ulach Ibra Erhu. And she in Honig she grew on clog and a stop of his grap she sues there and stole from the hockers, an ucher in a dermike, nor ha a herhila and derser oskelt a bura, nach roshe de hertike, mere her spray of ansa, of his cross share he a quid lava salacha, a lagan er ach log, reeve reached. Ni arna she jarmed er a vocal dorchi. Gach o'er in a yeek shin, gur her and clog er stole ee. Le ucker a ruse of fowl. Agus e a chasa er tuhel, sheer, sheer. Gud jigar kula she click, agus trick a trick. Quishla an clog filter a reesh. Chorus casta an teel, a chuid fika agus artery. Agus rum divracht sheeri an ni nach fector. A vogan e go ni. Fui drumkla or a lehinta. Counterclockwise. I place the key in the radiator slot and twist the valve with your shins. Back, back, until I hear the liquid drip, the fall of fat glottal drops, trapped gas freed, and the click and trickle trick of pipe pulse. Sending heat through the house's circulatory system, all its veins and arteries concealed under a skin of walls. The mystery of that which moves under the surface like clockwork. I think of the chiming clock in my grandmother's house and that story that she always told, the one where it was a summer's day and she, a newly arrived bride, left alone to prepare the midday meal, a tableau. The dinner ready, 
table laid, floor swept, she stood waiting, hands heavy with lack of tasks. Seeing that the clock had stopped, she climbed on a stool to correct it. The winding key gripped in her fist when her husband's father threw open the door, roaring that she should never lay a finger on his wife's dowry, <laughs> never put her filthy hands on his clock ever again. She remembered those words she always said every time the old clock put her up on a stool to place the key in its slot and turn it with her shins back, back until she'd hear the click and trickle trick of clock pulse returned. This, the convoluted workings of life, all its veins and arteries, and the mystery of the unseen, of that which moves underneath the surface of our days continually. Lurg. A glanadum and shomer fulka could neem sheer or lower scholar, <coughs> Ashtar Vasco de Gama, a quid lunga muerica, a trasnu lear skull girl, sholta in arta, a bun and lahnig vi evo, the olint namar nalig, Niketa fir oga, bal traka, kipa a pinta scorbuka, a mule a curfulla. And Randa like Shilla, Agusa, a Glubernil, a Gurp, a Sneev Lepian. Alexangalari, Dridum Condera, Dilhoch Gach, Shanich Nad, O Silta, Gunta Burga, a Viknasaha Leblinta, Bruna, a Scriba, a Yaro, a Gazidan, a Rasa, or Oga, Dal Grachna, Rinna, Angalar, Poor, a Gashkrivu star, a Bean Almar Leerskoil, Shah, a Yochilach, and Hurt. Not digling dharma the in of our aim, Gwen. Smuinim shearer on gyak star shin agus me glana and shomer folka, mar ligam anal er glina on skahan, agus a hyo fekam lurog da lovam. Crock cree, a harring to madden egan, a gra, e lurog lova er skahan, skal er skal, tatu lumfos, er glina agus fui kraken. Ermachri is thus on track at Illin. Remains. I'm scouring the bathroom when a page of an old textbook returns to me. Vasco da Gama's voyage. The vessels that crossed vast blues of my schoolbook maps, their sails tall, pale. At the foot of the page was a pencil sketch of the crew's distress, tangles of young men shuddering in the agonies of scurvy, their lips bleeding, gums seeping, limbs writhing, all their bodies twisting in pained agonies. As the disease reached its end, every old injury would reappear. All the small hurts that had been healed for years, bruises and scratches first opened when they were only children. Scurvy made parchment of their skin and mapped their pain there. A reminder of the body's vulnerability that we can't ever really heal our injuries. I think back to that history book as I polished the bathroom surfaces when I pause to breathe on the bathroom glass and in that hot fog I see your scrawl, a heart you drew there some morning long gone. In those mirrored fingerprints you remain with me both on glass and under my skin. You mark this bruised heart still. Um, this is my last poem now, and I'm going to finish with a poem from Clasp. Do buy Clasp. Do buy Clasp. <laughs> <laughs> um, please do. Please buy Clasp. Um, <laughs> after that little announcement. Um, so I'm going to finish with a poem from Clasp, and <coughs> kind of like I've chosen a political poem because that's most of, as far as I can see, that's a lot of my function as a poet is... is is being political. And I'm extremely strongly in favour of the current campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment. It's really important to me. And as a veteran of the maternity services here, five pregnancies in eight years, I can testify to the fact that 
these lines, which are written by the amazing poet Sarah Clancy, who's here, I think, I hope, and who I'm about to quote, so she's probably blushing in the dark. <laughs> and she may have read this earlier, but I had to put the baby to bed, so unfortunately I missed her reading. She wrote these lines that really resonate with me, and it's a really important issue for women in this country. As long as we have the capacity to bear children, Ireland is not a safe place for us. Women rise up. This country hates us. Um, very strong lines and, and written by a very, very good writer. And the poem that I want to read, I wrote because I wanted, it's dedicated to the feet of Halep Navar, and I wanted to somehow in uh, writing give Savita an alternative choice. Um, no, I, I wanted her to live. I wanted her to live. I wanted to give her a country where she could have been listened to and a different choice would have been made and, and, and she would have woken up. And that's what I wanted. Um, and of, of course I can't do that but I could write this poem and I can say her name aloud very often when I'm reading this poem, Savita Help Never. This is for her, hoping that no one else will be ever in that situation ever, ever again. Waking. The procedure complete, I wake alone. The hospital sleeps. My fingers fumble over a new scar, jagged map stitched into my skin, empty without and empty within. I trace the wound and weep. The only sound I hear now is the retreat of a doctor's footsteps echoing my heartbeat. That's it. Political sensibility informed that last poem. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you set out to write a poem with political sensibility, do you uh, exercise caution in uh, trying to ensure you have a good balance between the aesthetic accomplishment of the poem and, and subject matter it deals with? They kind of go hand in hand. Like the writing process for me isn't even that conscious. Um, I feel driven to write something, whether it's just by how. For me, with my Irish work, it's often the texture of words, or the history of a word, or how words move beside each other, and, and I think there's a different aural quality to a lot of my Irish work. With political work, it's just that I'm really angry, or really moved by something, and the, the surface beauty of it can belie what's moving under the surface. So it's not conscious, I don't know. Paul, you've, you've, you've addressed the parasite issues. Uh, do, do. Does that question arise for you? I mean, we all we all know the kind of poetry that uh, it's, you know that, that where, the, where the message uh, unfortunately gets gets stuck in sort of language that doesn't really uh, inspire poetry. You know, the, the language of politicians. Uh, did, did you ever, do you ever find yourself having to consider those subjects when you're approaching a political subject? Um, I'm usually driven by by what I what I feel usually, um, <clears throat> which is anger. In, in when it comes to politics, usually anger is probably the, the overriding one. But with with that, it's a responsibility to, um, as you say, it's hand in hand. As you're as you're addressing the the issue with 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 the poem, or as the poem is forming and addressing the issue. Um, you want to give as much weight to to that uh, emotion as possible, and and I guess uh, the more intense um, the feeling uh, I had about the issue, the more pressure I feel to craft a very strong um, lyrical aspect of the poem, you know? strong poetic. You've both worked with languages other than English, as uh, writing in two languages. Um, 
do you think it's given you a special insight into uh, writing a poem that maybe people who only ever work with one language uh, lack? I don't know because I don't know anything yeah. else. Like for me, I started writing in Irish, and um, I turned to English out of necessity because if I was coming in here and standing up here and only reading poems in Irish, I'm excluding anyone who who hasn't got, like gone to school in this country, and a lot of people who have. And I didn't have the privilege of anyone coming to me or anyone, even still, offering to translate my poems for me. So I had to teach myself to translate my own work, and that was what led me to English. So I've nothing, like I've nothing to compare to. I don't know what it's like to only write in one and what well, I kind of yeah. do. Yeah, I don't know. Does your, but does your um, knowledge of one language inform how you handle language in, 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 in the other? I, um, I think once I started writing in English, I would much more put much more kind of embellishments in my Irish work and English work. I think English taught me things that I hadn't learned yet in Irish because Irish is my second language. Like what? Um, I just had a lot of fun with the texture of it. I made such an unholy mess at the start and all my first translations were terrible, but I learned a lot through making that mess and I learned to kind of grapple and, and play with language in a way that I hadn't had the confidence to do when it was just Irish because Irish is my second language and like grammatically and that kind of thing, I wouldn't be 100%. So English gave me a confidence to get my hands really dirty with, linguistically. Oh, you've worked not as extensively with the second language as, as Dyrrell has, but you, but you have done and, and, and more than one second language. Mm, I've written quite a lot. Yeah. In yeah. Irish? You've written in Irish too? Yeah, I've yeah. written um, probably a handful of Irish language poems, some of them thank you to you. It's a Dyrrell's <laughs> Irish good, Irish good poetry. Uh, I almost wrote one there earlier. I'll read it later. Do. Um, yeah, I write, I've written in five languages, five different languages. Um, I speak six. Um, the one I can't write in is German. I've got a couple of lines in German, but it just uh, doesn't at all lend to um, poetical sense for me whatsoever. Um, yeah, I'm sure they do inform each other, uh, especially when I get down to doing the translation. Like during, I'll immediately get on to doing my own translation of, of that poem. Um, and, and then, th then you start to see some uh, magic happening in terms of one language influencing another when it's not possible to say the same thing in both languages. Um, but I, I, I feel like almost I'm a different person when I'm writing in a different language. Uh, it's, a, it's a different spectrum of cultural references. Um, and you know, you're, you're talking with a different voice. Um, but it's only when it comes down to the translation I find that there's an interaction. Otherwise, not, not really. Doing with two books in Irish, behind you already, did you, I mean, did you have any feeling or concept of producing a debut in English? Did you, did, did the English book feel like a debut for you, or, or um, did it feel like a, an extension of, of, of your work in Irish? Um, again, I know I'm giving you a terrible answer, it's kind of hard to know, but Pat Boren, <laughs> who's the editor at Deadless Press that published my book, Tried to chance his arm and put me in for the the strong the shine strong award, which is the debut collection um, Price, award, yeah. and um, they said no because like obviously it's not her first book, mm -hmm. but yeah, I didn't feel like it was my debut. I was nervous about it in in a strange way because this kind of um, I was kind of sure footed with the Irish because you have a very clear idea of your tiny audience. The tiny audience for an English poetry book is still tiny, but it's like a teeny bit bigger. And I had a sense of people are going to read this that I don't know personally. <laughs> and that's a bit strange because it's some of the poems are very personal. But um, yeah, it, it was it was different, but it didn't really feel like a debut. And Paul, this is your second collection. Did you? learn anything from the first collection that, that, that put you down maybe a different direction in the second collection? Did, are you aware of the, the second collection being different in, in, in you know, accomplishment, structure, um, I, I It's more gutsy, you know, I think yeah. I, I just haven't held back as much as I did. But the first one I was, I was petrified of it failing, I think, so I was a little conservative with, um, you know, the overall choices. But with this I felt, you know, um, I could really let go a bit more. Um, but uh, 
it's apples and pears because I'm writing under such strange circumstances, fragments usually. I get a few weeks at a time to concentrate, otherwise it's fragments. So, um, you know, it's been an organic process. Uh, I, I guess uh, the editing side, the first book certainly helped me with um, being able to uh, instinctively know what, you know, where to come in, what tones to, how to echo poems with each other, how to look for the narrative, what's linking them. Yeah.